Hello, I am Dominic and this is part 2 of my Infinity Book Pro 14 review. If you haven't seen part 1 yet, just click here. It's chock full of fascinating info about the computer and well worth a watch. In this video, I'll be showing you what it's actually like to use it. Before I get to that, however, a small correction to what I said in part 1. Tuxedo no longer offered the Core i7 I have together with a 3K screen. Instead, you get a slightly newer and probably faster CPU. This, however, costs 280 euro more than the base config. As a tiny bonus, the laptop now starts at 1180 euro. Also of note is that there is no longer an option to get the machine without Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Now, let's take a closer look at Tuxedo OS. The system is basically Ubuntu Budgie 2004 with a slightly customized desktop. Anyone familiar with Ubuntu will be right at home after an initial adjustment period. The misbehaving icon I mentioned at the end of the previous video is the network icon. Not only is it decidedly low res next to all the high DPI goodness, it also turns into part of the caps lock num lock icon next to it when clicking on some things or alt tabbing between windows. It's not a huge issue, but still, not a great first impression. The inclusion of both plank, which is what this is called, and the bottom panel means you get all the icons twice. I was slightly baffled why someone would choose to do that until I installed the next cloud client. I can't live without it, so it was practically the first thing I did. It turns out the next cloud taskbar icon breaks the bottom panel completely. It's a good thing we have Plank now, isn't it? The right panel is very nice. You get quick access to settings for audio devices and applications playing audio, something I find very useful, as well as an out-of-the-way place for system notifications. This can be customized to only show the stuff you want. The main menu is very basic, both in looks and functionality. It allows you to search for apps, though sadly not files. It also gives you access to buttons for shutting down, restarting, logging out and so on. It seems someone really likes things to be in many places because you get all the same options here and even a couple here. Software-wise, you get all the things you'd expect to have. Firefox is the default browser, LibreOffice is there even if its icons are decidedly low res. For email, you get both Giri and Thunderbird depending on your needs. Tuxedo includes some of their own PPAs, or software sources with the system, and these provide extras like the Tuxedo Control Center or the WebFi installer. Which is just as well, because the provided WebFi pendrive, it does not boot. Maybe it'll start working if I recreate it with the installer. The Tuxedo Control Center shows you info about the current status of the CPU and fan and also allows you to switch between various performance profiles of the computer. A few profiles are provided. You can activate each one separately for running of mains and battery power. You can also create your own. One area I found severely lacking is file search. I am used to just pressing the super key and typing in part of the file name. Here, I need to use the catfish file search or the files window. This means launching an app and doing multiple key presses or using both mouse and keyboard to finally being able to open the file I'm looking for. I actually found myself just opening the app I want to use and using its recent files menu, which I haven't done in years. If I were to use Tuxedo OS personally, I'd absolutely need to solve the next cloud debacle and find a more efficient way to get at my files. If anyone knows how to do that without ripping up half of the system, do let me know in the comments. I have talked about the keyboard in the previous video, but I just want to reiterate how great it is. Typing is very comfortable, key travel is just right, and overall it's a pleasure to use. 
One thing worth noting is that if you turn the keyboard backlight on, it won't turn off together with the screen. You can turn it off manually if you wish, and that won't wake the screen up. The touchpad is also very good. If I were to nitpick, it takes a little too much force to click unless you're clicking at the very bottom, and perhaps the click itself is on the loud side. And speaking of loud, fan noise. The laptop's BIOS lets you choose between two performance modes. These are overridden by the Tuxedo Control Center, with the default mode being roughly equivalent to performance here. Using the default profile, the laptop's fan is constantly on, though almost inaudible. Working with a document or browsing the web will keep the fan at around 25%. This will change very quickly if you do anything even a little more demanding. Opening a 1080p video will soon make the fan ramp up above 30% and that is already clearly audible. Working on these videos in Caden Live would have no problem putting the fan at over 50%. This does make the machine a bit annoying to work with. As I was doing these videos, whenever I needed to record something new, I had to leave it idle for a bit, waiting for the fan to spin down. When rendering a video, the fan goes full blast and sounds something like this. Fan noise is inevitable when working under high load, and in this case it's not bad. The cooling solution does a pretty good job overall. With the fan at full blast, the CPU stays at 95 degrees, running at 3.5 GHz. This, of course, is where the Tuxedo Control Center comes in. For the review, I focused on the out-of-the-box experience, but here you can tweak the performance and fan profile in the way that suits you. Speakers are on the underside and rely on the surface of your desk to reflect sound in your direction. Expect poor results when the laptop is on your knees. As expected, Sound is serviceable with little bass. Even in a quiet room, for videos and games you need to set the volume to at least half to be able to hear anything. For comfortable listening, three quarters up is a must. Full volume is maybe a bit loud. This is half volume. Three quarters. Okay. And full. Hey Jen, you going to the party tonight? Dude, we talked about this. This translates almost directly to earphones, both Bluetooth and wired. Half volume is the most comfortable setting, with full just a little bit too loud. You won't be damaging your ears with this device. Music is a little bit better, with full volume definitely too loud in a quiet room. Video conferencing being the norm in these virus-infested times, let's hope the laptop's microphone and camera are up to the task. Image quality from the camera is decent, if a little on the dark side and oversaturated. The microphone does a good job of picking up my voice and not the fan, which at this point, more than 10 minutes into this fake conversation, is at a whopping 60%. And here's what the other person looks and sounds like on the Infinity Book. With speaker volume at three quarters, the fan is audible, but doesn't drown out the person's voice. Tuxedo say you can get up to eight hours of office use. This has not been my experience. The best I've been able to get is less than five hours at almost half brightness. Writing documents, browsing the web, nothing too demanding. It isn't terrible by any stretch, but more than three hours less than what is being advertised. For video conferencing, you'll be looking at around two hours of runtime. Luckily, charging is pretty fast, with some two hours for a full charge using a 61 watt USB-C power supply. The most disappointing, however, is time in suspend. Starting off a full charge, you can expect the laptop to turn off after around 60 hours. That's less than three days. The CPU comes with four cores, 
8 threads, 2.8 GHz nominal and 4.7 GHz turbo frequency. Let's see what it can do. I tested using the Foronix test suite and compared to a couple of other CPUs I have access to. A Ryzen 7 3700X with 16 threads is more than two times faster, no surprise there, while an 8-thread Ryzen 5 3500U is around 50% slower. Intel's Iris graphics promised significantly improved performance to what we had before, and I was curious whether it could run anything decently. The Unigine Superposition benchmark promises roughly half of what a 1050 Ti can do, while a 980 Ti is almost exactly six times faster. Let's take a look at how games actually play. You've already seen a bit of Life is Strange 2 running on it. It's not very demanding and you can get decent frame rates at a pretty high resolution on medium. The first of the new Tomb Raiders is very playable on normal in 900p. which unfortunately cannot be said for Rise of the Tomb Raider, which is barely playable even at 800p on the lowest settings. Mass Effect Legendary Edition, on the other hand, is very playable. while the Ascent will barely hit 30 FPS at 800p on minimum settings. Its top-down perspective doesn't lend itself to loss of detail, and it looks pretty rough. Would I want to play it like that? Eh. On the other hand, something like Streets of Rage 4 would be fully playable with no compromises. While far from a gaming laptop, it's certainly competent enough to run older or less demanding games. Additionally, the fan noise I found so distracting in general use is absolutely fine when gaming. All in all, it's a great little machine, somewhat let down by its speakers and a little too much fan noise. The screen is as great as one might hope, and I can easily recommend it for a wide range of uses. And that includes some light gaming on the side. If you would like to see something I haven't covered here or in part 1, let me know and I'll see what I can do. I hope you enjoyed the review, do subscribe if you're interested in this kind of content. I'm planning to keep looking at hardware, software and any other tech I find interesting. Who knows, maybe next time it'll be an electric scooter or something. Thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.